Won't you join me in prayer? Oh, most gracious, holy God, I just come before you, asking that you would humbly hide me behind the cross, that your message would be heard, that you would speak clearly and boldly through me. Lord, we give you this time that we might leave this place filled with your spirit and changed. We ask all of this in your son's holy name. Amen. I'm Deanne Lynch, your associate pastor of Congregational Care. It's my delight to be with you today. Do keep um, the Hildebrandt family, as we said, in your prayers as uh, Michelle is sick. So, God has blessed us with five senses, right? Our hearing, our sight, our smell, our taste, and our touch. Now, as Pastor Adam tries to figure out what's in that kid zone o'clock box, have you seen that? We used to call it stump the pastor box uh, when I was associated in another church. You never knew what was in it. And you had to come up with this deep theological explanation of what was in it like that. He's done great, but he uses his senses when he gets that box. If you notice, so sometimes rattle it and listen for the sounds. I've even seen him kind of sniff it to see if he can figure out what's in there. But using his senses, he's able to get a guess of what it is before he opens it and uses his eyes to see. Which of the five senses do you think that you would miss the most? Which of the five senses do you think works the best? Well, I think I would miss the sense of smell the most. Smell even helps you taste. When there's a smell that comes to your mind, sometimes you're reminded of something. You're reminded of where you were the last time you smelt that or who you were with or how you might live out even that smell. Well, my grandmother on my mom's side loved to bake pies, particularly fruit pies. And usually she would make two at a time, often one for us to have then and one to put away in the freezer for later. So as I was young and I was watching and helping her cook, I, I asked her as she put the pie into the oven, I said, how long do we bake it until we can smell it, was her answer. To which I thought, until you can smell it? Well, how is that an answer? How can you time that? I, I said, it's kind of like the when you have to, you're having trouble spelling a word and you ask someone, how do you spell that? And what do they tell you? Look it up in the dictionary. Well, if I knew how to look it up in the dictionary, I'd know how to spell it, right? So it never made sense to me, that answer. And grandma's saying, well, when you smell it, it will be done. So as I bake pies now, um, I Google or look up because I can't can remember how long it takes to cook a fruit pie. I set my timer and every time I smell my pie baking and the timer goes off. The senses help us and bring us back to those remembrances. We, each of us, have times in our lives when a smell will take us back to a time in our lives when we see or taste something or smell something. There's a memory that comes to mind. And I think tasting and seeing work together to give us that full experience of our senses. I mean, we might even forget where we put our keys and then what? A, a sight comes to mind. You're, oh yeah, I set it down there. And you go and you find them. We remember. Or you might wake up one morning to a particular smell, to coffee or bacon being cooked, and you transport back in your mind to a memory that's associated to that. That smell triggers a remembrance. Well, the same happened with the Israelites. And we've been journeying through the book of Exodus in this sermon series calling Navigating the New. And as we look at what it means to live in and into our current reality, we ask questions. We ask questions like, what do we do? How do we respond? Where is God in all of this? When we look at the book of Exodus and the story of the Israelites, a lot is revealed to us. I mean, how are we as a church navigating the new? How are we moving forward to the promise? moving forward 
together. Well, today we're in the 13th chapter of Exodus. I'll be beginning at um, the third verse, Exodus 13, beginning at verse 3 and reading through verse 10. Moses said to the people, Remember this day on which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, because the Lord brought you out from there by strength of hand. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Today in the month of Abid, which is about spring, you are going, you're going out. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and all the other ites, which he swore to your ancestors to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this observance in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day there shall be a festival to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen in your possession. And no leaven shall be seen among you in all your territory. You should tell your children on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. It shall serve for you as a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead so that the teaching of the Lord may be on your lips. For with a strong hand, the Lord brought you out of Egypt. You shall keep this ordinance at its proper time from year to year. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Here in this first sentence that we read in today's scripture, we are told what? Remember this day. The word remember does not mean to recall how something happened so that we can go back to that and to stay in that same period, re-experiencing it again and again, but rather it means to recall, to to bring to mind or, or even to recollect, but not to remember so much to stay in that exact moment never to change, never to grow, never to move. We're also told to remember during our sacraments, during our sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion. Remember, that word calls us back to a place sometimes where hard things have happened, but sometimes and always where God is ever present. When we remember these acts of Jesus each time, it becomes more of a reality to us. I was baptized in the United Church of Canada as an infant. I do not have a personal recollection of what happened that day. But because my family showed me pictures and they told me of the story and we remembered and we remembered and we remembered to the point that when I for myself affirmed my faith in Christ and remembered my baptism, I truly remembered because we, I had heard that story. I had seen those pictures. And so it became real to me. It's an active remembering. Not to repeat that action, as I said, but it's almost remembering as though it already happened to remember God's goodness in the midst of the struggles, in the midst of the struggles the Israelites were facing, in the midst of our struggle, not just recalling what took place, but it's also very much about participating in the remembering. Our memories serve as those points along the way in which we look back upon and we realize the prevenient grace of God. That grace of God that goes before us, that grace of God that when we look back, we can see God's movement in our life even before we knew there was a God. God was there wooing us, calling us into a relationship. And we look back and we remember. We remember in the ways that we were changed And those memories allow us to step into that new, to step even into the unknown with hope and with a perspective. 
And through this continual reminder of hope and the consistent perspective of God in our lives, that enduring grace that God gives us, we're encouraged to step out in confidence and and even to reach even higher and bigger and better things. Isn't that what God's doing in our lives now? Isn't that what God was doing in the Israelites' lives? These moments, they serve as those points in our lives where we lean in. We lean into that promise of God in our lives. We lean into the direction that God is calling us also. And God has moved the Israelites. And it's in confidence that we believe that God is moving us as well. The movement of the Israelites was from bondage into freedom. And in the remembrance of making bread, it invites us to do the same. Now, in this bread that they are instructed to make, it's not that delicious, fluffy kind, you know, the kind that you make and you knead and it rises and you can smell the yeast and then you punch it down and let it rise again and you divide it up and rise again and and then you bake it and that smell, that smell of baking fluffy bread that you don't even want to wait for it to get cool enough to cut. You just want to rip into it because it just tastes so good. That takes a lot of time, usually a couple hours of waiting and smelling, no waiting. Well, this unleavened bread that the Israelites were invited to make isn't fluffy. It's very easy to make, it's um, flour and oil and a little bit of salt. It's more like a cracker than it is bread. You you probably remember or have seen the, the matzah bread that is used in the Jewish Passover, that cracker. Well, these crackers, this unleavened bread, they were instructed to make it because they had to be on the move quickly. They needed to be ready to go. They didn't have time to wait for their bread to make. In fact, they were told to make it the night before, but they procrastinated, made it that morning, and actually had to leave with some of it on their back. So that hasn't changed either. We're all a little procrastinating. But that bread was so that they could be on the move. It's it's a bread for the journey. It's, It's a bread that could be carried with them. It's a bread that didn't need anything else. It it was like a meal. It was enough for them. Matzah literally means drained out. Now, some say that it's a reference to the way that the bread was made, that it was strained out. Others think it means because there's no yeast in it, so that's drained out of it. But I wonder if it's because of the most basic ingredients were used. It's maybe it's for us to realize that it's the basic stuff that is what's important. Maybe in our frustration and even in the middle of this pandemic, even in the situations that we're not always dealing with really well, the change that is put upon us, causing us to do things differently, causing us to look at what is important Maybe that's what this reminder is for us, is to remember it's the simple things. It's the basic things. I mean, the scripture confirms to us over and over again as we remember that there is hope in the midst of pain. Even if it doesn't look like how we want it to look, we still have hope. We still have a promise Do we need to hear this story of redemption so that we can tell others that God is still in the business of bringing people out of bondage and out of the stillness that happens? Because only then are we able to see that goal of God when God brings us out of that. The best way to trust God is good is to remember God's faithfulness and God's goodness. God can be trusted because God has been faithful. We gather around a table, communion table. Why? Because God is faithful. 
We gather around the communion table again. Why? Because God is faithful. And God has called us to a life out of bondage, to a place where God is setting us free. Setting us free through the blood of Christ. Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us, who said, do this in remembrance of me. Not just once or twice, but every time do this in remembrance of me. This, this bread, this bread of life, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem, house of bread. Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread, our living life, the bread of life. That bread, which is simply given, simply and straightforwardly given, no extras, just Jesus. This unleavened bread, it's, as I said, is a bread for journey, a, bra- a bread that allows us to depart quickly because we don't have to wait. We gotta be ready to go. In this Exodus story, we read of bread, an unleavened bread, a bread that's ready for the journey, a journey forward, not a walk backwards, a journey into where God is calling us and is calling us. You know, the Israelite people had a dream. They had a dream of the promised land. They had dreams of the way that God was going to move. They confidently leaned forward into that promise. But what were the other things that they were told to do? Well, if you look at verse eight, We're told, you shall tell the children. We have that same responsibility to remind our children and the next generations and the next generations what God has done through previous generations. Not being nostalgic and and wanting to just sit there and, and not move, not having a desire to going back to the way it was, but dreaming forward. Last week, Pastor Adam showed us one of the Bibles, which we delivered to 14 second graders this week. Those second graders, as they received those Bibles, the joy on their faces, the smiles that came, the reality that they felt that you, their church, loves them. You love them so much that you desire for them to be in God's word so that they might grow closer to God as well. It was such an exciting time to to hand out those Bibles and to see their faces and for them to do that. Because it is because of what God did for me that I came out of Egypt, that was in the scripture, for me to remind the children what had happened. Because God made a way for us out of Egypt. They claim that story for themselves. And I can't wait to see what these second graders are going to share with us. We challenge them to find stories and to tell us what their favorite story was. You might have them even ask you, what's your favorite story? And if you've been following us on Facebook, we're reading through um, Exodus this month. Last few pictures of, of the scripture were from the Bible that they received but I can't wait to see how they live out the reality that God is still God. And we will remember when God showed up in our homes or on, our front porch, on their front porches in rain with Bibles and balloons and gifts. And we will remember and fully inquire and realize that love. We'll remember when God showed up on our computer screens or on our smartphones and we were able to worship together, even though we're apart. Seeing families worship together, some across the United States and across the world. I can't wait to hear the stories when we do worship together, of those stories where you met God, even though we weren't physically together. We are together in spirit. God is with us no matter where we are. Imagine the stories that we'll tell of God's goodness, even in the midst of these trials and difficult time. 
even as Jesus met in the upper room to have this same meal, the Last Supper, before he went to the cross, Jesus began to tell that old story in a new way, reminding all of us that we are to move forward, to share the communion of Christ with everyone so that we might be able to tell the stories, that we might be able to move from bondage into freedom. Now, sometimes that bondage is a bondage of anger or control. Sometimes it's a a bondage that we live in, a bondage of, of shopping too much or watching too many sports. Or maybe it's a bondage of having to have perfect grades. I went to school with a girl that only accepted pointy grades, as she called them, and they couldn't have little lines after them either, only pointy A's. But being freed from that bondage so that we might be free in our relationship with Christ to go where God is calling us. Yesterday, we had our annual conference for the North Georgia United Methodist Church, and we did it virtually, uh, the first time in history of doing, doing that. But on that, in that time, Bishop Sue, our bishop, quoted um, Corey Ten Boom, and she said, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. We don't know what is before us. I think if we all are, are real to ourselves, we didn't expect this to be lasting, what, six months? We thought, oh, a couple weeks. But we must trust an unknown future to a known God. And I think that's exactly where we are. We need to remember. We need to remember where we've met God in our lives. We need to remember God in the story of the Israelites. We need to remember and we need to share these stories with our kids, with our generations, because the reality is the church is one generation away from instinction. If we don't share the stories and proclaim our faith in Jesus Christ, where will the church be, the body of Christ, the church be? So I pray that as you remember that you see God and you remember what God has done, is doing, and will do, that you remember God and God's faithfulness that always allows us to lean into the new confidence because it's through this remembrance of Christ that we've come to know God is faithful. And if you don't know this God, this faithful God, this God who loves you exactly the way you are but loves you too much to leave you there, I'd love for you to talk to me or... Pastor Cynthia or Pastor Adam, give us a call. Find us today. Let's talk about, let's remember this Christ in your life. So as we lean in, as we lean forward into the way that God is leaning, might you remember and know the, with confidence that Jesus loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. Let's pray. Most gracious and holy God, we just praise and thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you for the love which you give each of us. Oh God, help us so to realize that love that you have for us, that we are precious in your sight and that your desire is for everyone to know you, to realize their relationship that is found in you. So God, guide us, protect us, be with us in all that we do as we share our remembrances of you. We pray this in Jesus' name, the bread of life. Amen.